Hello everyone and welcome to vlog 3 of SAC 7101, the coaching process. The first question that we'd need to try to answer is what is the coaching process? As stated by Kushin et al, despite coaching is considered as a very personal process, the following key features are present in the coaching process. First, that the coaching process is not necessarily cyclical, but is continuous and interdependent. Secondly, the process is continually constrained by a range of objectives that drive from the club, the coach, and the athletes involved. The third feature is that the process is a constantly dynamic set of intra- and intergroup interpersonal relationships. These relationships are locally dialectical between and amongst agents and structure. The fourth point is that the coaching process is embedded within external constraints, only some of which are controllable. The fifth and last key feature is that a pervasive cultural dimension infuses the coaching process through the coach, club and athletes and their interaction. There is also a coaching philosophy that relates to the coaching process which everyone should be aware of and know why we do what we do. Parkin says that this is developed from personal truths, principles, attitudes and values or which may change develop over time. We change and develop over time as we always strive to improve on what we do now with our athletes in the way we train them in order to reach new heights and improve on their current level with the aim to get the best out of their potential. In fact, the Trivasic training model, which I will use with my athlete for this vlog, was not always the coaching model I used. However, today, this is the preferred method I use as I see improvements not just in performance, but also in less injuries throughout the season. The athlete used for this vlog used to do gym before, but had stopped for some years and restarted lately. She never experienced the triphasic approach, so this was her first time trying this method. The session structure included pillar preparation, dynamic stretching, the main session, and static stretching. The target of the session was the eccentric phase with the area that I will critically analyze and noticed that could have been improved after watching the recording as the type of cueing used. Before going deeper into talking over my coaching with critique over content, I will briefly state how and why I use the pillar preparation, dynamic stretching and eccentric phase of the triphasic training. The pillar preparation is one of the main components of the EXOS training system. This is done the first thing in the training session. It includes soft tissue, mobility and stability or activation, which leads to optimize the body for performance and lay a foundation of advanced movements. We also perform dynamic stretching with similar movements that will be used in the main session to prepare the athlete better when she is doing the exercises with load. The eccentric phase, as part of triphasic training, was the main objective of the session. As stated by Dietz and Peterson, the eccentric phase is the acceleration or lowering portion of the movement. It is associated with muscle lengthening. During this phase, kinetic energy is absorbed and stored in the tendons of the muscle structure to be used during the stretch reflex. For the most effective means in applying stress to the athlete and improve the eccentric qualities, I used large compound movements with an accentuated, slow, eccentric phase. The time under tension allows both the muscle spindle and Golgi tendon organs to feel and adapt to higher levels of stress compared to normal dynamic lifting. This will lead to potentiate the muscle spindle and inhibit the Golgi tendon organs leading to an improved stretch shortening cycle and increased force production. When analyzing the main session, I could observe that the cues I was using were more internal focused at first, both when I was explaining during the demonstration and also in the first steps of the exercise. However, I switched to more external focused cues and analogy when I wanted the athlete to do better reps, even within the same exercise. As stated by Winkelman, internal cues are cues that prompt a focus on lip motion joint motion 
or muscle activation, while external cues are cues that prompt a focus on an outcome or interaction with the environment to achieve an outcome. Analogy is cues that prompt a mental image comparing the movement to a familiar scenario, constraint or object. For example, in the barbell back squat, the athlete was cued to push hips back with weight on the heels while keeping chest up and shoulders back during the demonstration and instruction. However, the athlete was not managing to do the exercise well and also had her heels raised off the floor. So she was cued to imagine she is sitting down on a chair on the way down and explode through the roof on the way up. It is evident that the next repetition was immediately better. During another exercise, specifically in the barbell Romanian deadlift, I cue the athlete to push the hips backwards, make sure the hamstrings are loaded and the bar stays close to the shins while maintaining a flat back. During the exercise, after the second repetition, I cue the athlete to imagine she is closing the door of a car when lowering the barbell. After the exercise, the same athlete told me she felt better focusing on this cue in the following repetitions. Considering this feedback from my athlete, I should have questioned more myself. Should I use immediately more external cues and analogy in the following exercises? Does the athlete remember more these cues which will lead to a better retention phase? Since we as coaches are looking to see whether there are positive shifts in the pattern, the performance or both from one session to another, I can use what Winkelmann call the silent sets. This is used for example when me as a coach try new cues and want to see if they result in improved motor skill retention. This is done by the coach employing one or more silent sets where they see nothing and simply observe the athlete perform the movement. If the athlete maintains or betters the changes seen in past training sessions, then the coach can be confident that learning has occurred. If the athlete on the other hand still regresses, then the coach knows that more time is needed for the athlete to fully adapt or they may need to evolve their coaching strategy. This will be an opportunity for the athletes to show not only the coach but also themselves that they have mastered or are on their way to mastering a movement. During both the barbell hip thrust and forward step lunge, I still kept on cueing the athlete first through internal cues and then moving to more external cues and analogies to help the athlete improve her movement. As we learned through our lectures, the coaching process is complex and dynamic in nature and there is more to the coaching process than just the actual coaching session. Reflecting on this particular one-to-one -one session, even though demonstrating and showing the athlete how to perform the exercise is important, the use of verbal communication should also be considered. As London states, verbal communication is used to direct learners in how to perform a skill or to provide encouragement during a session. The way you use cues have a big impact in coaching and to direct an athlete's attention. One of the things I can improve in my coaching is to use more external focus cues and analogies rather than internal cues from the beginning with my athletes, also knowing these can be used during both the instruction and feedback phase. This is in line with what the literature states and as Wolf et al suggest, using external focus of attention allows greater automaticity whereas internal focus of attention interrupts the automatic motor control ability and thus could affect the motor performance. Here you will find the list of references used for this vlog, the coaching process Thank you for watching.